Welcome to our continuing uh, pursuance of History 1302. Now we're talking about the rise of the dictators. Uh, we're going to cover uh, American foreign policy, which is isolationism, and that picks up off of 1930s Part 1 and Part 2. So the last slide you should have watched talked about American foreign policy. So we'll pick up on that just as a reminder, and then I have a long slide that we need to go over with an excruciating detail uh, that outlines a pattern of the rise of the dictators. Then we'll talk about uh, the dictators in order in which they actually emerged in, um, in world government, and that's Japan, Italy, and Germany. Um, people always want to like gravitate straight toward the Germans. That's very Eurocentric, uh, and I understand that. I, people want to go where the, the flame is the brightest. That, that's, that's understandable. But as it turns out, Germany was actually the last country to emerge as a dictatorship in the 1930s. Uh, then I'll end with a summary, and uh, that'll continue on to World War II. So as we're going through all this, um, please bear in mind that the big issue I want you guys to get out of the rise of the dictators is the underlying theory that, the underlying thesis statement is that World War II is a standalone conflict. In other words, this continued dynamic among historians even that uh, World War II was an outgrowth of World War I. Uh, modern historians, especially Gerhard Weinberg and some of these other guys that are like uh, really starting to uh, come on strong now, they're trying to point out that no, World War II is actually a standalone conflict. Now, I've talked about extensively, I've talked about uh, the underlying cause of World War I. I'm s and then I talked about uh, BRAT, which was the Treaty of Versailles. And so I'll be referring to those repeatedly as we go through all this. The underlying cause of World War One, if you'll recall, six underlying causes of World War One, and then uh, we talked about BRAT, which is the Treaty of Versailles. And you're going to find that either the countries that are involved in dictatorships in World War Two had nothing to do with the Treaty of Versailles, or in the case of Germany, the Treaty of Versailles was a dead letter by 1939 when the war started. So there's just you know the connection there. Uh, some of the players are the same, but um, uh, World War II is not an outgrowth of World War I. It is a standalone conflict. So with that in mind, uh, let's go on and uh, get kicked off here. Let's start with American foreign policy and isolationism. As I pointed out on an earlier slide, um, U.S. foreign policy was absolutely about America first. And the two big names that are involved in that are Henry Cabot Lodge. He was a senior senator from Maine. And uh, in the aftermath of World War I, he wanted to be involved in the Treaty of Versailles. But Wilson acted as his own Secretary of State there. And for those of you guys who don't know or need a reminder, once again, treaties are not uh, actually uh, a product of the president or of the executive. Treaties can get negotiated through the State Department. The, the president does have to understand it, but they are ratified by the Senate. They're ratified by Congress, specifically the Senate. So Wilson made several um, you know, kind of rookie errors when he went to like negotiate the Treaty of Versailles. He should have taken a bunch of these senators along with him so that they would be invested in what's going on at the Treaty of Versailles. They could get a little bit of a... a um, a political boost themselves and having been there they could go back to their constituents and talk about how they're like these uh, uh, very important people and that they need to be reelected and they had a real uh, role to play in the Treaty of Versailles but Wilson did not do that he acted as his own Secretary of State he didn't give anybody any kind of political gain on this back at home and that was really a kind of a, a rookie mistake but then he arrived back at home and so uh, Henry Cabot Lodge was like first off he recognized and Americans were coming alive to this, that the United States got nothing out of World War I. We got nothing out of it. You know, we, we were instrumental in the defeat of Germany, and we helped out our allies, but we didn't get anything out of it. We weren't going to get any territory. Uh, we weren't going to get anything political. We weren't going to get any money. Um, we didn't get anything out of that. And so Henry Cabot Lodge, a, a really an arch conservative, and that's fine, but he didn't personally get any political boost out of this either. And he wanted that. And he said so repeatedly. But Wilson wasn't listening to him. So I'm not trying to make Henry Cabot Lodge out to be a petty individual. That's not the case at all. 
Uh, he was responding to the will of his constituency, the good people of Maine. But he said, listen, we didn't get anything out of this. We're not going to be part of the Treaty of uh, Versailles. We're not really going to be a part of the League of Nations, which Wilson really wanted badly. And he said, because we're not going to get anything out of that. We're going to have to fund it, and we're going to have to back it all up. But there's no gain for the United States there. So he bitterly opposed that, and people really did support this idea that uh, we needed to stay out of foreign entanglements. Uh, by the early 1930s, uh, Henry Cabot Lodge retired, uh, but then Charles Lindbergh, uh, again, the lone eagle, he's the guy that uh, is really going to pick up this torch of America first. And um, again, Charles Lindbergh, a very compelling figure. He had a very compelling personal story, a uh, terrible tragedy in his own life, uh, but he was also a very compelling speaker, and uh, he really reached out to a lot of people. And so uh, the American First Movement in the 1930s, he was all over that, and he was absolutely dedicated to it. And many Americans responded well to that as well, and they kept saying, listen, we've got to fix our own problems at home. So ultimately, and this is the last bullet point that I have up there, the American people said, listen, we're not going to have any foreign involvement. And the press made sure that that happened, and so FDR had to comply with that. And he saw the political um, handwriting on the wall, and he said, listen, okay, I will absolutely embrace that. And he made that a political thing on the Democratic side. The Democrats would ordinarily, they'd be very, very careful about um, making sure that American interests overseas were protected. They were perfectly willing to do that, you know, limited involvement in overseas affairs. But because of the mood of the nation, FDR absolutely complied and, and embraced this idea of America first, no foreign involvements, no foreign troops overseas. We're not going to get involved. We're not going to get involved. We're not going to get involved. So as we go through this rise of the dictators, uh, one of the things I want you guys to uh, pay attention to, and I'll try and mention this several times as we go through it, just like the underlying cause of World War I, what did any of this stuff have to do with America? Bearing in mind always that FDR had to comply with the will of the people and stay out of foreign entanglements. Last but not least, uh, this is a trap that many people fall into, including some well-trained historians. You can't look at the rise of the dictators through the filter of World War II. You can't do that because World War II had not happened yet. You have to look at these things in camera. You have to look at these things in isolation. You have to look at these things as they emerged at the time. Uh, World War II hadn't happened yet. Nobody could foretell the future. Nobody could do that. Uh, the Germans, the Italians, and the Japanese, they were all acting in their own interest, and they were making decisions that suited themselves at the time. So don't look at this through what is about to happen in World War II. Don't do that. Look at what's uh, going on in camera. So... To conclude on this slide, again, America is absolutely isolationist. The people won't put up with it. The press is watching everything that FDR does. He can't have any meaningful foreign policy because everybody would jump right on him. Everybody is watching. So no foreign policy. We are absolutely dedicated to isolationism. So with that in mind, let's go take a look at a pattern of the rise of the dictators. Now this can be a very uh, intimidating slide. But let's kind of uh, put it in the right setting and kind of demystify what, what you're looking at here. Now, for those that you can who, who can do this, uh, I urge you to, like, uh, take a screenshot of this and just print it out because you're going to need this. If, for no other, if you can't do that, then just be prepared to, like, pause your YouTube and, and go back and take a look at this pattern. Um, you know, call, call your YouTube up in a separate window pull up this pattern and then press freeze and then go back to the first window and listen to what I'm saying. Because what I'm going to do is apply this pattern to every one of the countries that are involved. We're going to go right down the line. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Maybe not in that order, but you're going to see every one of these things. So with that in mind, let's talk about what you're seeing here as a whole. Now, Please take a strong note here and don't forget it because you're going to need it later. And every time I say you're going to need it later, you wind up needing it later. So in the 1950s, we had uh, an overseas uh, assistant ambassador, and he was in Russia. 
and his name was George Cannon, K-E-N-N-A-N. And George Kennan was the undersecretary. He was the assistant uh, uh, ambassador to the Soviet Union, the then Soviet Union, to Russia. The ambassador was back in America. Uh, I think it was Avril Harriman. It doesn't matter who the ambassador was, but he was back in America doing something. And the State Department sent George Kennan in Russia a simple question. Listen, look at, look at this thing. See if you can figure this thing out. Give us an answer on this issue that we're worried about. And George Kennan had the opportunity, took that opportunity to write what's called the Long Telegram. The Long Telegram. And in it, he gave this tremendous analytical um, paper. That's what the Long Telegram is really all about. And he said that, listen, the dictators in the years preceding World War II established a remarkable pattern, which is what you see here. And he went on to say, Russia is on the last step. And so if you want a war, World III with Russia, with nuclear weapons by that time, then you know, you've got to start paying attention to what's going on. If you want to avoid that war, World War III with Russia, with nuclear weapons, you've got to pay attention to what's going on. Because Russia has gone through every one of these steps and they're on the last step now. And so this had a profound impact on the State Department as well as uh, Truman, and then later Eisenhower, and then uh, Kennedy and Johnson. This had a tremendous impact. So we can use this pattern to go back and take a look at the rise of the dictators. Again, 1950s, George Kennan said that the dictators used this pattern to, to get into power. And when he was writing in the 1950s, he warned that Russia was like about to do the last step. So let's take this pattern and put it into a practical application with the rise of the dictators. So step one, just let me go through these very quickly and then we'll actually put them into practical application with Japan, Italy, and Germany. And those are the flags that you see up there in the upper right. Uh, those are not the flags of Germany, of Japan, Italy, and Germany today. Obviously those are the flags that they used at the time. So our pattern, step one, external and internal political pressure leads to the rise of a nationalist militarist party, which is exactly what happened in all three of these countries. You had all sorts of turmoil going on, all sorts of international activity, and uh, the result was the rise of a nationalist militarist party. Now, continue on with strong notes here. When we talk about a nationalist militarist party, they stand for two things. They stand for their own country. And they keep saying, our country's number one, our country's number one, our country's number one. And they stand for a strong military, strong military, strong military, strong military. So listen to me carefully here. This puts every other party, political party in their country at a strong disadvantage. In other words, these nationalist military party, parties are saying, listen, if you're not voting for us, you're voting against the country and you're voting against a strong military. And so if you vote for this other party, they are automatically not patriotic. They are automatically for a weak country. And so this put politically, this is really, really super smart. And you put the other political party at a very, very distinct disadvantage. Every party wants to say, you know, our country's number one and we agree with a strong military. But these nationalist military party were making that their issue, their primary issue. And it made the other party seem like they're like not supporting their own country and they're not supporting a strong military. So this worked perfectly. And it worked in Japan, it worked in Italy, and it worked in Germany. So one way or another, these parties, step two then, these parties use the democratic process to attain power. I cannot overemphasize this. People lose sight of this all of the time. In none of these countries, none of these countries, was there a military overthrow? There was not. In all three of these countries, Japan, Italy, and Germany, these political parties got elected. The dictators got elected. They were put in by the democratic process. So this should kind of uh, ring a bell, and I want you guys to make this connection. So the rise of a nationalist military party, and then using the democratic process, well, what would Americans say about that? They would say, well, that's fine. A nationalist militarist party, well, you know, they're for their own country and they're for a strong military. Well, so are we. 
And so that's okay. And then using the democratic process, well, that's what we stand for. These people got elected. And so that would have nothing to do with us. We would be supportive of that. But then step three, the National Militarist Party overthrows the democratic process from within. All three of these parties did that. All three of these uh, countries, they did that. Uh, Japan, Italy, and Germany, they overthrew from within. Now, again, in America, we could rationalize that by saying, listen, that's their problem, not our problem. You know, let the people there solve it. But they're overthrowing from within these nationalist militarist parties. And it's not, it's not always obvious from the outside. But that's what happens on all three of these cases. Now, in America and especially, we're willing to like overlook this because of step number four. These parties, the nationalist militarist party, have, they have to deliver. Even our own worst politicians uh, in Tammany Hall, Boss Tweed said very famously and repeatedly, at some level, you have to deliver something to the people. You have to do something for the people. So even our own politicians are saying, listen, you've got to deliver. And sure enough, in Japan, Italy, and Germany, all three of these dictators, once they get in, in power, they were elected. Then they overthrow from within, and we will talk about that. But then they all delivered. All of them delivered. They did. And so that makes them popular within their own countries. Now, we all know what's about to happen in these countries. They're about to go through this terrible, terrible conflict, and bad things are going to come out of that. Millions are going to die. But that hadn't happened yet. The people of these countries, Japan, Italy, and Germany, don't know what's about to happen. Some could kind of foresee it, but nobody was listening to those people because it was like, okay, they're predicting something that they had no idea about. All right? So these parties are going to deliver the perceived will of the people. The next step, number five, these parties, these national and military parties are violent and they will use violence to stay in power. They are self-protective. But in all three of these cases, uh, and this is the big thing, please make a strong note here. This is what really separates out Japan from Italy and Germany, Italy from Japan and Germany, and Germany from Italy and Japan. This separates them out. The way they exhibit the violence is radically different one party from the other or one nation from the other. And so when we get to exhibiting violence, I want you guys to make sure that you take a strong note here. Strong note when I talk about violence. And I'll try to remind you that as we go through uh, the presentation. Step six, five, six, and seven, they're kind of interchangeable, but five and six, uh, the party or the nation exhibits aggression, usually through territorial gain. And sure enough, the Japanese will do that, the Italians will do that, and the Germans will do that. All three of these countries will exhibit aggression, usually through territorial gain. Not always, but usually. And it's one step after another, after another, after another, until the only outcome is war, which is the last step. They keep on taking the next step. Every time they get away with some little something, bam, they take the next step. And though other countries, maybe the French, the British, or the Americans, will send a signal, a warning signal. Don't do what you're doing. Stop doing what you're doing. Please reverse course. Please alter what you're doing. But these dictators are absolutely going to ignore that and do the things that suit themselves and their own country. And they're going to keep shoving and shoving and shoving and being aggressive and getting away with it until one day they didn't get away with it anymore. And the outcome is war. So this then is the pattern. And so please make, you know, if you can, print this out. If you can't, again, open it in a different window and then go back and forth to it. All right? So with that in mind, uh, let's go on and put this into practical application. The first country that we're going to talk about in terms of this pattern is we're going to talk about Japan. When we talk about a... a um, militarist, nationalist, militarist party getting into power. Japan is really the first one that actually makes that happen. And so uh, here we go. So the first bullet point there. Japan at the close of the First World War. Strong note here. Japan was our ally in World War One, And they kept saying, you know, they've been a signatory of various treaties 
if you recall, uh, one of the underlying causes of World War I were all these various treaties, entangling alliances. And Japan had signed a lot of treaties with Western powers. They're trying to get involved. They're trying to be, you know, a, a first-class nation. They're they, they had great power status. They did have great power status. The only Asian country, well, let me put it this way, the only non-European country to enjoy great power status was Japan. So they were highly active on an international platform. And they had all sorts of treaties. So when World War I broke out, the Japanese said, well, you know, we're part of this. We're part of you guys. We're part of, we're, we, we want to get involved. We want to try to do the right thing. Strong note here because this is important. This was absolutely rejected by the Allies, particularly the British. I've mentioned before that David Lloyd George, he was uh, the prime minister at the very end of uh, World War I, and his diaries became available in the 1940s, 1950s after he'd passed away. And he makes it clear at the time, this is what the thinking was at the time in Britain. And this is, he was very, very racist about it. And the French are, the French, they're not really racist about it because they were perfectly willing to use other um, races to help them out, Africans and Asians to help them out in the war. They were perfectly willing to do that. But the British, they were really, really, I'm sorry to say this, they were really racist about um, not wanting the Japanese to get involved. And the French kind of went along with that. So the Japanese were rejected. Well, okay, the Japanese said, all right, fine, fine, fine. Now, they did get an advantage. They took over German territory in Asia. Uh, the Germans had a big, giant base in a, a Chinese city called Xingtao, and they had some of the islands out there in the Pacific, Guam in particular. So the Japanese took all that over. Well, continuing on with that, I'm still on bullet point number one, believe it or not. Uh, Japan got involved in the League of Nations, and they actually did a really good job. But they knew that they were being uh, kind of racially profiled by the other European nations. Uh, in the League of Nations, uh, the Japanese provided judges for the international court. But it's unfortunate that these nations would like bring some court case to the international court for adjudications, and the Japanese, everybody agreed with this, did a really great gut job. They looked at international law, they tried to like form an opinion, and they came up with uh, fair verdicts in all their cases. But then these European countries that were involved in the international court said, well, we don't like the, the judgment, the judgment went against us, so we're going to do what we want to do anyway. In other words, the Japanese were doing a great job in the international court, but there was no enforcement. And so again, they were being snubbed. And they kept getting snubbed. They kept getting uh, maltreated and, and minimized. Uh, a lot of sources talk about the Washington Treaty of 1924. And we don't have time to talk about the, the, that here, but it was a, a supposed to be a limitations treaty. As it turns out, if you really look at the treaty, uh, it actually treated Japan really well. But it was supposed to limit the size of battleships uh, that a nation could build and the number of battleships that a, ship, uh, that a nation could build. Well, it gave the Japanese a huge advantage, as it turns out. But they didn't see it that way. And so they got all in a big, you know, a big giant, uh, they felt like they were insulted. They got in a big giant huff about it, and they left the League of Nations. And the Japanese at home felt like this was all based on race, and there's a significant amount of truth to that. The Japanese understood they were being treated badly because of the race. And they were really, really super in insulted by that, as they should have been. Now, economically, uh, Japan, this is the second bullet point, Japan was like, had a booming economy. Now, we've seen this in uh, emerging industrial economies before. You have a boom and bust cycle. And the Japanese were doing great on the booms, obviously. But then these busts would come along. They didn't know how to handle it. Uh, their economies would destabilize. They would over, they would get heated up and they would get overheated, and then they would destabilize, and there would be a bust. So uh, in uh, 1922, I'm sorry, 1921, there was a tremendous earthquake. And I think I have it up there. Well, there was a tremendous earthquake in 1921, and it's the great Kanto earthquake, and this is in and around Tokyo. So they had a booming economy, but then they had this tremendous earthquake. It was, they didn't have the Richter scale back in those days, but it was like an 11 on the Richter scale. And it absolutely leveled the city. And so this like led immediately to an economic meltdown. 
uh, America helped out a whole lot, uh, especially Hoover. And I've talked about that before. Hoover helped out the Japanese a lot. Got all sorts of fundraising and sent all sorts of equipment and medical supplies. He did a lot to help them. So uh, the Japanese economy rebuilt really quickly. And then it got too hot and it destabilized. So 1929, 1936, um, the Japanese build, 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 but then uh, everybody else goes into an economic decline because of the Great Depression, and so they're left with all this manufacturing that had no place to sell all their stuff, and so they had another bust. So it's a boom and a bust and a boom and a bust, like one after another after another after another. Strong note here. In other words, how does this help a nationalist military party? So very strong note here. It's not a bullet point, but this is the analysis. Japan was being maltreated diplomatically, and there was a strong racial connotation to that. And so the Japanese militarist, nationalist militarist party, they really got a, a, a start because of that. And their message is clear, and I'm pointing this out before. Uh, their real message is Japan's number one, and we're great people, and we do tremendous things, and we, you know, we deserve to be treated better than what these Europeans are doing to us. America was really bad about that, and so were the Europeans. Now, on an economic front, strong note here. All the historians, especially a guy named Stephen Turnbull, he's the big guy on uh, Japan, but there are several others. They point out that a lot of families, especially in western Japan, that is to say the opposite side of the Tokyo side, western Japan is very... Um, conservative in its outlook it's very rural there's a lot of farm communities and the problem here is that a lot of their children are starving these booms and busts like create a lot of havoc in the economy of japan overall but the farmers are always like really really badly hit and so strong note now a lot of these farmers a lot of these rural communities which would have a, a more conservative outlook under any circumstances send their sons to military schools it's not because they want to have their sons like grow up to be soldiers nobody wanted to do that but the military schools had to feed the children so if you're sending all your sons off to military school you're trying to save their lives you know the daughters weren't going to go to school under any circumstances in japan at the time and so or they would be like taught at home but, you know, mom and dad could probably take care of one or two or three kids, the girls, but the boys, well, it was just so much easier to send them off to military school. And then the school would be compelled to provide food and shelter for those kids. Well, the obvious result here is that you have a whole lot of children, an entire generation of children, who were taught in military schools that went to military academies as very, very young children. And they're inculcated, they're, they're driven uh, educationally to be, you know, strong nationalists. And Japan's number one. And the military supplies all the answers. And so um, this really does boost this nationalist military party, especially through the 1930s. So 1929 to 1945, Japan is going to seek to dominate China. And they need strategic resources. And in 1937, the Sino-Japanese War begins. Now, this has a couple of effects. Number one, it allows the Nationalist Military Party to really begin to deliver on their, pro on their promises. So, uh, step one, you have a Nationalist Military Party. And then the party starts to get elected because the, the party becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. So, in the Japanese diet, their version of parliament, you get more and more seats that are going to Nationalist Militarists. And finally, these nationalist militarists, they're beginning to like exert a lot of control over Japanese foreign policy. So the army, especially, is running amok. They're doing whatever it is that they want because they have a lot of political support back home. Nobody can go against them back at home because it's the military and everybody's a strong nationalist. So in China, the Japanese army gets control of um, China. They had had... Uh, gotten control of a large region, I'll have a map up in a minute, uh, called Manchuria. Now, at the time, Manchuria was an independent country. It always been an independent country. But it is, like, really, really poorly populated. There's, like, no, hardly anybody there. 
Well, the Japanese saw that as an opportunity because there are a lot of natural resources there, especially coal and iron ore. There's lots and lots and lots of that in Manchuria. And so the Japanese simply moved in. So we have a, a couple of the, the steps like thrown in at once. Number one, the Nationalist Militarist Party is getting into power in the Diet. I'll talk about their executive here in a minute. And they're insisting on getting all of these raw materials from some other place. So they're taking one step at a time. They go in and take over Manchuria, and they start getting all these raw materials. Well, the raw materials are sent to Japan and puts people back to work. Please write that down. All these raw materials go back to Japan, and that puts a lot of people back to work. And that's all the Japanese wanted. Now, the fact is they're starting to build uh, lots of military equipment, artillery and uh, ships, especially they're building a huge, gigantic navy. And uh, But they're putting a lot of people back to work, and that's all anybody wanted to do. They wanted to work so they could like get some money so they could eat. And so this makes the Nationalist Militarist Party look really, really good. Now, 1936 to 1945, I have it down there, and this is the actual name of the Japanese Militarist Nationalist Party. Now, in Japanese, it's like this really, really long name, uh, but um, for the purpose of this class, we're going to call it the Imperial Rule Assistance Association. Now, take a look at that name, the Imperial Rule Assistance Association. It sounds perfectly benign. There's nothing dangerous about that. It's the Imperial Rule Assistance Association, and that's the name of the party. And it seems like this party is an association designed to help the emperor. Well, nobody on planet Earth could deny that. That, that just sounds like a great, you know, it's a, it's a really uh, a clever way of making this party tasteful to the people. On the other hand, the Imperial Rural Assistance Association is being run largely by the army. And so they get voted in because... This, the Imperial Rule Assistance Association, which sounds benign to the ordinary Japanese even, but it's being run by the army. So the use of violence, strong note here, the use of violence. Now, again, this is different than what the Italians will do, and it's different from what the Germans will do. In Japan, violence will be used openly and against opposition parties. I'll say that again. In Japan... The Imperial Rule Assistance Association will stay in power by using violence openly and against opposition parties. Uh, opposition parties will cry out and they'll say, listen, we should not be in Manchuria. We shouldn't be doing what we're doing. Uh, later on, I'll talk briefly about the Marco Polo Bridge incident, which leads to uh, the Sino-Japanese War in 1936. And these people will be in Japan saying, we ought not to do that. We, gotta do, we, can't, we can't do that. We have to act within the law. Well, at least one was giving a speech and a military officer, a cadet out of one of these military academies, jumped on the stage and stabbed him to death with a samurai sword. Now, that individual was arrested and later executed, but he was made out to be a hero. So here's the army using this, an example of the army using violence to stay in, stay in charge, intimidate the other parties imply that the other parties are not uh, not loyal to Japan, that they're not acting in a way that, uh, you know, the Japanese can understand as being loyal to their own country. And uh, it's just it, this intimidation shuts the other parties down. Well, that simply means that the Imperial Rule Assistance Association, they're running the entire show, and they, becomes, they overthrow from within, and there becomes a one-party system. Because they kept getting votes, they kept getting more votes, they kept getting more power in the Diet, then they intimidated the other parties, and that meant that anybody that was going to actually be in the Japanese parliament had to be part of the Imperial Rule Assistance Association. That means an overthrow from within. Now again, what did that have to do with the United States? Nothing. Here's a party that sounds like they're just saying Japan's number one, well okay. And... The United States, they were saying, and I'll have a slide up there in a minute about this. The Americans were saying, well, listen, they go into this country that's like empty, and they start developing it and start, start developing all the raw materials. And that puts people back to work. Well, Americans could understand that. They were going through the Great Depression in the United States, and they could understand that. 
But they also, and this is the big thing, none of this had anything to do with the United States. Now, I'll have a map that talks about this in a minute, uh, but the Japanese continued to expand. In other words, they were able to take over Korea. They were able to take over part of China from the Germans after World War I. Then they were able to take over Korea. Then they were able to take over Manchuria, turn that into a puppet country. And so the army is starting to listen. They're taking one step after another, after another, after another, and nobody's lifting a finger to stop them. So this simply encourages them to take the next step. Now, the United States, in 1940, 1941, uh, we hear about what's going on in, um, in Nanking and what's going on in China and all these vast murders, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So the United States, we try to like put an, an embargo on them to influence the Japanese government to stop doing what they're doing. Uh, there are some uh, raw materials that the Japanese could not produce internally. There's no oil wells in Japan. There are none. No amount of oil exploration is ever going to get any oil wells in Japan. They just don't exist. So Japan was getting all of her fuel imports and oil imports from America. And FDR knew that. So I said, okay, you guys are doing all these horrible things. I'll put an oil embargo upon you. And this created a little bit of trouble in America. Again, the press did not like that because it seemed like we were doing a, a foreign policy. And they didn't want FDR to be doing that. But the Japanese reacted really, really strongly to that and in a negative way. And the idea became that Japan, with all these successes, one success after another, after another, after another, could actually successfully challenge the United States of America. So with that in mind, let's go on and, um, as I, I often say, let's put some meat on those bones and um, take a look at what's going on internationally. So uh, with this slide, let's take a look at what's going on internationally. Now, um, the setting of this is an event called the Rape of Nanking. So let's back up a little bit. In 1936, the Japanese army staged a reason, a cause belli, a reason to go to war with Japan. I'm sorry, Japan staged a cause belli, a reason to go to, to war with China. And it's called the Marco Polo Bridge Incident. So in Japanese history, right the way through the war, they always called the war in China the Incident the incident that's taking place in China. They never even labeled it as a war in Japan. They didn't do that, which is a propaganda thing. So the Marco Polo Bridge incident, uh, there were Japanese soldiers in Beijing. They staged a small invasion. The Chinese had protested more about that in a moment. And, you know, but nothing came out of it. So the Japanese army shot a bunch of Chinese people had them put into uh, Japanese uniforms and scattered them all in and around the Marco Polo Bridge in Beijing. And then the Japanese army made the big propaganda thing saying, yeah, the Chinese are coming to get us. They shot a bunch of our soldiers. Well, that was a lie, but it was propaganda. And so because of that, the, the Imperial Rule Military, uh, the Imperial Rule Assistance Association back in Japan, they could say, okay, well, this is a cause for us to go to war with China. So they did. And the Japanese were far ahead of the Chinese, and here's the reason why. China was in a state of complete disarray. After, you know, three and a half thousand years, uh, their imperial government had failed in 1911. And in China, there was one warlord after another, after another, after another. It was just the strong man rule. Uh, Sun Yat-sen came along in the 1920s to try to, like, bring uh, uh, stability out of all the chaos. And he tried to introduce a Western-style democracy. And that had worked for a while, but then, uh, you know, it failed because it's just these warlords just wanted to cut a piece of China out for themselves. And so it did not work. So uh, in the time frame we're talking about, the, the late 20s, early 30s, and through the mid-30s, another party came along, and that's the Communist Party under uh, Mao Zedong. And they're trying to like, he's, Mao Zedong was nothing but a warlord. That's all there is to it. He's just a warlord, a strong man. On the other side were the nationalists, and that was under a guy named Chiang Kai-shek. And Chiang Kai-shek, uh, he was just another warlord. 
He made no bones about it. He was an absolutely a warlord. But it was the communists and the nationalists were fighting each other. And they could never pull together as a country. And the individual Chinese person out there was just trying to stay alive. And it was highly destabilizing. So other warlords would spring up and then either the Chinese uh, nationalists would wipe them out or the communists would wipe them out. And so they could never get any kind of like meaningful, um, stable government to actually confront the Japanese. So the Japanese, again, they staged the uh, Marco Polo Bridge incident, and they simply began invading China, taking over all the coastal regions, taking them city by city. The Japanese were unified. They were technologically way ahead of the, of the Chinese. They used terror bombing. That is to say they got their bombers over any one of these cities that they wanted to capture and just told the bomber pilots, just to dump out your bomb loads. The Chinese had no meaningful air force at all. They couldn't, like, stop this. They didn't have any uh, cannons that could shoot up into the air to shoot these bombers down. And so the Japanese were just sending in wave after wave of bombers who were dumping out their bomb loads on these cities, and then the army would just, like, march right in and take it over. Well, one of these was, uh, this event was called the Rape of Nanking. Now, a little bit of a sidebar. I need to move on with this, but a little bit of a sidebar. Uh, about 20 years ago, uh, an author named Iris Chang, she was watching some ser some war series, uh, a documentary or something like that on TV. And uh, her mother was there, and, and there she was in New York City. She was an author. And uh, I guess it was her grandmother who was there. And anyway, uh, this... Um, the story goes, this documentary was talking about this terrible business that was going on in Nanking as the Japanese were advancing. And Iris Chang turned to her grandmother and said, listen, you were in that city at about that time. Can you tell me about it? What, what do you know about it? What, what's going on here? And uh, Iris Chang, her grandmother, said, listen, I'm not having nothing to do with that. I'm not going to discuss it. It was terrible, terrible business, and I'm trying to bury that. Well, Iris Chang was a good author and a, and a pretty good historian as well, and that became really, really intriguing, and it had a strong personal resonance with her. So she wrote a book called The Rape of Nanking, which was really, really controversial when it came out. And the Japanese, they this is uh, in uh, the 1990s, and the Japanese absolutely were livid. They said none of that stuff happened. They were denying it still. You know, 50 years after the war, they were still denying this thing. But this is what happened. And so uh, the Japanese began closing in on the city of Shanghai, which is actually in southern China. And they did a terror bombing. And uh, the Japanese, I'm sorry, the Chinese army evacuated Shanghai. And the Japanese simply moved inland. And they occupied it. And then the murders began. And that leads us to that photograph that you see up there in the uh, upper right. And you can see there, there's just this big giant mountain of skulls. And I always challenge the students, you know, what, what is, what's going on there where there's this big giant mountain of skulls, clearly. And what do you see in that kind of gray area right in behind it? Well, those are all the skeletons. And I say, well, what can you, what, what can you infer from that? And it turns out the Japanese were using these poor Chinese people for samurai sword practice. They were beheading them. And the Japanese made a, an issue out of that. They said, and within the Japanese army, uh, they would say, listen, you're a soldier, and you look like a weak soldier or a useless soldier. And so they'd get some Chinese person over there, and they'd tell the soldier that was judged to be like a, a weak soldier, and they would say, listen, bayonet this person to death, murder them. And the soldier would, like, do that or be shot. And they'd say, well, you didn't do a very good job murdering this person, so get another Japan, another Chinese over there. All right, murder this one. And keep bayoneting them to death or beheading them with a sword until this soldier became a proficient murderer. And so why are all the skulls separate from the bodies in this picture, that this horrifying photograph that you see up there? Because they were using them as, as samurai sword practice. That They're just murdering them. And there are plenty of films that show this. Lots and lots of evidence. Well, the Japanese were systematically murdering and killing all the men and then just raping all the women, systematically. 
just unleash all the soldiers on the women and just just rape them all to death. So they occupy the, the city of Nanking and systematically decimate the population. Estimates vary somewhere between 150 and 350,000 dead. Well, that's a difference of 200,000 people. And so why can I give you this large um, spread of numbers, somewhere between 150,000 and 350,000? No one will ever know how many died. No one will ever know. We'll never know how many people were murdered. Occasionally, the Chinese will turn up mass graves, and they actually they don't talk about it. They they you know they rebury all the dead, but they don't talk about it because it looks bad on the Communist Party. The Communist Party did not really lift a finger to stop the Japanese during the war. So the Chinese Communists they don't they don't even talk about World War II anymore. They just don't. And the Japanese did a really uh, a horrible genocidal activities during World War II in China, so they don't talk about it either. It's really ironic that the only ones that are truly talking about the war as it exists in China are the Americans. We're the only ones that are discussing it. And the Chinese, for their reasons, they don't want to talk about it. And the Japanese, for their reasons, they don't want to talk about it. But somewhere between 150,000 and 350,000 are dead. So this information gets out of China because there are Americans in China at the time. Remember, it's nationalist China, not communist China. And so this word gets out about these horrible things that the Japanese are doing. And so public attention, and this is by the mid to late 1930s, shifts against the Japanese. Uh, this kind of gives uh, FDR political cover to like start these oil embargoes later on. Uh, what's going across the bottom of the slide there? Uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, propaganda. Manchuko, the son of a new nation. And here are a couple of Japanese farmers out there, and this is, again, this propaganda. I'll have a map up in a minute. What the Japanese are calling this puppet state of Manchuria is Manchuko. And what you see here is, oh, it's just a couple of innocent farmers, and they're out there in this land, and they're trying to turn the land into a farmland so we can feed our people. And there'd be other propaganda photographs that would say, listen, we're just, you know, we're trying to get this iron out of there and this coal that's locked up in there for raw materials. And the Manchurians were not doing that because they're backwards and there's nobody there. So to Americans who have no idea what's really going on, that seems okay. Uh, the second slide over, uh, this again is the Japanese nationalist militarist. There's the flag of Japan, the rising sun, and there's this huge giant navy in behind it. And again, it's just, you know, the propaganda uh, um, image says it all. Japan's number one, and we're going to have a big giant military. Well, okay, then uh, the next slide. Uh, come on, friends. And it's this Japanese soldier holding up the flag of Japan, and he's waving at all these other Asian nations. That's what's going on here. Come on, Asia, stand up for yourself. Let's, you know, let's, let's make Asia for the Asians. And that became a very, really big deal for the Imperial Rule Assistance Association. Asia should be for the Asians. Well, for a United States that was absolutely dedicated to isolationism, that sounds great. Yeah, let's get all these other imperial powers out of there. Get the Germans out, get the French out, get the British out, and especially us. Let's get out of there. Leave Asia for the Asians. That's fine. And if the Japanese are going to be a leading power, that's okay. The last slide, uh, the liberators of an oriental people. And that's 12 8, that's 12 8, 1941. Okay, so there you have it right in the middle as a Japanese soldier. Again, if you look at him carefully, this is an interesting little piece of propaganda. They're making the Japanese soldier actually look more Western. And this is very much propaganda. But on two of, I'm sorry, on three of the four slides that you see there, the, the images that you see there, Understand it's all in English. Certainly there's a lot of uh, propaganda for the Japanese people that is all in Japanese, obviously. But I want to point out to you that a lot of these propaganda posters are going to be in English. And so your target market is the local people who might be able to speak English, but especially it's for Americans. It's for the Americans, it's for the British. Asia is for the Asians. That's for the British and the Americans. Get out. The liberators of the Oriental people. Okay, again, that's that's for the Americans. You know, we're, we're the Japanese are saying, listen, we're going to like liberate these um, Oriental people from 
European domination, European colonialism. And Americans really responded to that. So the propaganda is like really, really, um, uh, uh, it's very, very effective. In other words, it plays on the sympathies of the American people already. We didn't want to be involved in there, and we don't really care what's going on in China or Japan. Let them solve it for themselves. We have problems of our own. But the overall is that Nanking, uh, the rape of Nanking in 37, that really does switch um, American attitudes against the Japanese when we find out what's really going on there. Not that we're going to do anything, and FDR can only do a little bit. More about that in the next slide. Now, another propaganda trick that the Japanese are going to use is the East Asian co-prosperity sphere. I know it has this big, giant, huge name. The Japanese were like really famous for doing that sort of thing. The East Asian co-prosperity -pros sphere, if I can just say it myself. The Japanese used that as a propaganda tool. And the idea was Asia was for the Asians. And Japan was going to be leading Asia into, you know, the new century, getting them out of this medieval past. Japan was going to be the leader. And in America in particular, we were okay with that. Asia should be for the Asian people. Get everybody else out of there. Strong note here. The East Asian Coast Prosperity Fear was a smokescreen. And what I mean by that is that Japan was saying, listen, let's get all the Europeans out of there and stop European colonialism. But what was really going to happen was the Japanese were simply going to replace European colonialism, which was bad, with Japanese colonialism, which was infinitely worse. I'll say that part again. The East Asian Coast Prosperity Sphere was a propaganda tool. The Japanese were saying to everybody else, listen, we just want European colonialism out. But the Japanese were going to replace European colonials, which were bad, with Japanese colonials, which were even worse, much, much worse. The Japanese felt like these other Asian countries, Malaya and the, Burma, the Burmese and everybody else, were inferior to them, racially inferior, which is ironic. And they were perfectly willing to enslave them, which is exactly what they did. So how bad colonialism was in Asia when it was being administered by the Europeans, primarily the French, the British, and us, the United States, Japanese imperialism was much, much worse. Their colonialism was much worse. So there are two uh, political leaders that I want to discuss for just a moment. Fuma Marikanoe, he's the guy down at the bottom. And uh, he's going to embrace this Imperial Rule Assistance Association, and that makes perfect sense to us. He'll be the prime minister through uh, most of the, the 1930s. Now, very briefly on Fumimaru Kanoe, because I don't want to talk about him a whole lot. Uh, he was first cousin to the emperor. He was Prince Fumimaru Kanoe. And so he's, he's like really closely related to the emperor. And as a close relation to the emperor, he felt like, you know, he should be able to get his own way without too much difficulty. And the problem was, of course, the army and the navy, they said, well, we have our own ideas of what should be taking place. And that would, like, conflict with what Kanoe wanted. The problem was that he was really, really sensitive to that sort of resistance. And so a problem would arrive or the army would do something overseas. More about that in a minute. And Kanoe would, like, try to come up with some sort of response or an answer or uh, try to control the situation. And the army and navy would tell him, no, we're going to do our own thing. Well, he would get into this big huff, he would get all insulted, and his feelings would get hurt, and he'd run off to uh, his geisha girl girlfriend, his mistress, and he would, like, cry and all this, that, and the other, and, like, you know, have a big scene. But then he'd come back and say, okay, well, what are we going to do? Blah, 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 blah. Well, the Army and Navy said, we're going to do what we want to do. And again, he'd get into this big scene, and he'd go run off to his geisha girl girlfriend, uh, his mistress, and have this big sulk. Well, that's not the way to run a government. Under any circumstances, he had um, uh, uh, resigned once. The government stumbled along for a little while. Uh, they brought him back. And he, again, he's part of the Imperial Rule Assistance Association. But then uh, there was one insult after another, and um, he resigned again. 
And that leads us to Hideki Tojo. Now, Tojo, again, we're talking about the rise of a nationalist military party, Hideki Tojo. If you look carefully at the photograph, you'll see that he is clearly an army general. And he was, in fact, the chief of staff of the army. But then when Kanoe resigned for the last time, he stepped in and said, well, okay, well, I'll take over and be the prime minister. And he's the only one I really want you to know about. And so Tojo is going to be the prime minister through most of the war years. We'll talk about Prime Minister Suzuki later on, and that will be when we talk about the atomic bomb. Okay, so what happens next then? Again, it's one step after another. Japan has taken over Korea. You can see it on the map. Then they take over Manchuria, and they set up this puppet government called Manchuko. Then they stage the Marco Polo Bridge incident, and they take over large parts of northern China. And as you can see in that kind of a, that red-pink area in there, they take over a lot of port cities, and they take over Nanking. So they're doing one thing after another, after another, after another, and they're getting away with it. In 1940, 1941, America puts an oil embargo on them. Strong note here. So the Chinese look to um, Java and Sumatra, which is just like kind of to the northeast of Australia. It's all those islands down there. Now, it turns out that there are, in fact, oil wells down there. There is oil down there. Uh, there's a small kingdom down there called Banda Aceh, and they are fabulously wealthy uh, because of all the oil down there. They have a monopoly on the oil that's, that's, um, that gets drilled down there. And so Japan says, well, we're going to go down to that area, and we're going to take over all of that oil. It had been owned by the Dutch. The Dutch had a, a big colony down there. And so we're going to take all this from the Dutch, and we're going to take all that oil, and that'll be our oil supply. But to do that, you know, they're going to have to deal with the Americans, in the meantime, the Americans are finally really good and fed up with the Japanese, and they keep seeing the Japanese as like doing all kinds of crazy things and being, you know, unrepentant about it. So, strong note here. In 1941, early 1941, FDR is going to move the U.S. Pacific Fleet from their home base in San Diego to the Hawaiian Islands. And this is designed to send a signal to the Japanese, a little bit of battleship diplomacy, a little gunboat diplomacy. We've seen that before, that we are watching and we're really upset as a nation. I'll say that again. FDR is going to move the U.S. Pacific Fleet from its home base in San Diego to a new home base, which is in uh, Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. And this is a signal to the Japanese, a little bit of gunboat diplomacy, that we are really, really interested in what's going on out there in Asia. We don't like what the Japanese are doing. And, you know, this is uh, the signals to the Japanese that we're watching, the movement of this fleet. Well, the Japanese, especially from Mamar Kanoe, this is just before he resigned the second time, he said, he pointed to the map very famously, and he said, that is a knife aimed at Japan's throat. The U.S. will move the Pacific Fleet to Hawaii. And Kanoe will point at the map and say, that is a knife aimed at Japan's throat. Well, this is the origins for the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor. Now, my resource on this is uh, Ari Hota, H-O-T-T-A. She wrote a book called Japan 1941. And she lays this all out in tremendous detail. Also, Gordon Prince, December 7, 1941, and another book called At Dawn We Slept. And all of this is like well-documented and well-researched. So those two books, Arihota, 1941, and Gordon Pronch, especially at Dawn We Slept, but also Japan, 19, I'm sorry, December 19, 7, 1941, these two books lay it all out step-by-step step what's going on. So the Japanese Navy, especially uh, Admiral Yamamoto, he's going to say, uh, listen, we can actually go out there, strong note here, the idea was, strong, strong note here, the idea was that Japan could strike the United States once really, really, really super hard and then offer the Americans a peace treaty. And the Americans, you know, being defeated in one big, big, giant battle and being lazy and wanting all of this... Um, you know, want to lay back and have all the good things in life, the Americans would accept this peace treaty from the Japanese. Well, this is a tremendous uh, miscalculation on the Japanese part. 
But again, they'd taken one step after another, after another, after another, and they said, okay, well, we'll just take the last step. Defeat the Americans in this big, giant attack on Pearl Harbor, then offer them a peace treaty. And they'll certainly take the peace treaty, and then, you know, the war with Americans won't have to worry about them anymore. So on December 7th, 1941, please write that down, Japan will attack, attack the United States at Pearl Harbor. And this was a tremendous victory on the Japanese part. Whether you like it or not, or know it or not, the Japanese planning on this was meticulous. It was amazing. And the execution was flawless. They did an outstanding job. But it was a terrible, terrible miscalculation. Instead of the Americans being shocked and like cowed and coward and, and, and just, you know, scared, this unified the nation and made the Americans like furious and ready to engage in all-out war against the Japanese. Uh, a couple of days later, I think on the 10th of December, um, Admiral Bull Halsey sailed in. He'd been at sea with uh, some of our aircraft carriers, and he sailed into Pearl Harbor. And there were still bodies like floating around in the water, and a lot of stuff was still on fire. And he very famously said, when this war is over with, the Japanese language will only be spoken in hell. And he read the situation correctly, that the American people would unify that this isolationism business is over with, and that we're going to go after the Japanese with everything we've got, which is exactly what happened. So when we take a, back, take a look back at your pattern, we went through every bit of this. Uh, step one, um, internal problems like lead to the rise of a nationalist military party. They get elected through the democratic process. They overthrow from within. The Japanese Imperial Rule Assistance Association did exactly that. Um, they deliver the will of the people. They get people back to work. They start stealing all these resources from other people, and they put people back to work, and they did. And so uh, that, the party became very, very popular, and the Japanese as a people are very conformist, and so they all agreed with the Japanese uh, party, this military, um, this Imperial Rule Assistance Association. They used violence to stay in power. Again, at least one of their prime ministers was assassinated. Other of these speakers are going to be murdered. They're speaking out against imperialism. They take one step after another, after another, after another, usually through territorial gain. It's right there on the map. And then the last step was this attack on the United States. And that draws us into the war. And they'd taken one step after another until the only outcome is war. And so they did every one of those steps. So although these situations are really, really complex, I hope you guys uh, kind of follow what's going on here and how that pattern is going to work. Because we're, we're briefly now going to go over Italy and then we'll go continue on to what's going on in Germany. So in Italy, the rise of fascism. Now, the background of this is really, it's really, really strange. In other words, Italy comes to this whole idea of fascism in a very, very strange way. And I'm going to like try and be really brief on this. First off, we start with World War I. And Italy had been our ally, just like in Japan, Italy had been our ally in World War I. They'd been our ally. And the Italians fought really hard. They fought very bravely. Uh, they expended a huge amount of uh, a treasure, a huge amount of blood to stop the Austrians and the Germans. And they had. And they committed to the war, and they'd done a good job. The fighting was extremely difficult. But then Italy got nothing out of the war. Orlando was going to go to the Treaty of Versailles. He's going to try and negotiate. He's going to try and get something out of it. And the British and the French, I'm sorry to say, they acted very selfishly. Um, Wilson would not support the Italians in trying to get something out of the war. And so the Italians got nothing out of the war. Well, the story goes... And I'm being deliberately vague here, okay, because I don't want you guys to have to, like, get into the, the weeds on this. But the story goes that an Italian adventurer decided that Italian Italy should have gotten at least something out of the war. And so this, this guy, this just ordinary person, went to the city of Trieste, which, if you think of Italy on the map, it's like a, it's the shape of a boot, and this would be on the back side of the knee of the boot. Not the heel, but the knee, way up on the uh, upper coast of the Adriatic. Adriatic. There's a port city there, very beautiful. It's called Trieste. 
and it had been Austrian for years and years and years and years and years. But this adventurer went to Trieste and said, this is an Italian city now, and that's it. Taking it over. You know, don't try and stop us. Well, Austria, they were absolutely wrecked after the war, and they couldn't, like, they couldn't lift a finger to stop this sort of thing. So to make a long story short, this Italian adventurer went to Trieste, said, this is an Italian city now. And Italy said, yeah, I guess we can go ahead and go take that over because nobody's going to stop us. And the people of Trieste were like, well, well, listen, we just really don't care. We're just hungry and we want some food. We want somebody to be in charge. And Austria couldn't do anything about it, so this guy got away with it. The guy got away with it. Which leads us then to Mussolini. So here we are in the early 1920s. And Mussolini observed all this. Now Mussolini had been in World War I. He had been a combatant. You can see he's got his military uniform on there. And those, those medals are not just a joke. He actually earned many of those medals. Well, before the war, uh, Mussolini had been a newspaper reporter. He'd worked in the newspaper industry for a while. And he'd been a teacher, a history teacher. And as you all know, history teachers are the most dangerous people in the world because we know all the tricks. We study this, and we know all of the tricks. Well, Mussolini saw what this adventure had done, and he said, well, if that guy did it, I could do it. And so he forms this fascist party. He is, he's the one that forms the fascist party. Now, it's spelled up there a couple of times. Make sure you get the spelling correct. And so this is a nationalist militarist party. And Mussolini, uh, you know, I'm not trying to make a joke out of this. I'm not trying to, like, uh, perpetuate any kind of stereotype. That's not what I'm trying to do here. But Mussolini, he absolutely, he played to uh, Italian sensibilities. And he's a very bombastic personality. A bombast is somebody that's going to get out there and yell and shake their fist. That kind of, uh, that picture that you see there at the bottom, uh, that's him. And he's wearing this uh, expensively cut military uniforms. And he, he'd well, like get a tank or something like that and put it in a city square. And he'd get on the front of a tank and he'd yell at the crowd and get a big giant speech going. And his speeches were always the same. Italy is number one. Italy should be better. Italy should like be at the forefront of nations. And he kept preaching that message. And he kept saying, we're number one, we're number one, we're number one. Any Italian anywhere in America, in, in, in the world, especially in America, if they did good things, he was out there yelling, yes, we Italians are number one. Marconi was out there making all these um, uh, uh, advances in technology, and Marconi hated the fascists. He hated Mussolini. But Mussolini would say, see, Marconi, he's an Italian, and he, we're number one, we're number one, we're number one. And any Italian anywhere that had some kind of, any sort of, positive impact, he would use that for propaganda value. Uh, the Italians were building tremendous uh, cruise liners and, and passenger ships, and he would say, yeah, we're the best. Um, there had been a, a, a search effort for a team of people that were trying to discover the North Pole, and the Italians were involved in that. That turned out badly for the Italians, but he made sure that everybody understood that the Italians were out there trying to help in this rescue effort. Anything that the Italians did, no matter how microscopic it was, he was saying that great things were coming from the Italian people. And this appealed to the people. So sure enough, in the uh, Italian government, Mussolini got more and more seats in their, their form of parliament, and more and more seats and more and more seats, until finally the king, they did have a, um, a, a, a constitutional monarchy, and so the king invited Mussolini to like form a government. Okay, you'd be the prime minister. And Mussolini went up there. He's the head of the fascist party, the black shirts. And he said, okay, I'll form this government. And then the first thing he did was jam through this law that got rid of the monarchy. And so, once again, he overthrew from within. So you have the rise of a nationalist militarist party, mostly because they were like uh, treated badly after World War I. But again, they'd been our allies in World War I. So this party gets into power, they get voted in, and then he overthrew from within. He, he threw out the king. 
and the fascist party is extremely nationalistic and they keep saying good things about the Italians and um, he begins to, he has to deliver. He has to deliver the will of people. Now there are a couple of icons, but the first, the only one I really want you guys to, to know is that he's going to make the trains run on time. And that was supposed to be some sort of a, it was like a joke in many ways. But just to put it in the right setting, please understand you guys that back in those days, the only way to like travel any distance in Italy is to go by train. Uh, the Autostrada is the way to travel around in Italy now, and it's basically the Italian version of the Autobahn, which is absolutely an adventure. And if you ever get a chance to like drive around in Europe, I urge you to do so and try the Autostrada because there's like basically there's no speed limit. And that thing loops and, and goes this way and that way all the way through Italy and is crazy. And you could rent some really, really fast cars. You can actually rent a Ferrari and go roaring around on the Italian Autobahn and uh, have an adventure. You might get killed, but it'd be a great time. Anyway, in the time frame we're talking about, the only way that can get to point A to point B, really, in Italy is go by train. Well, the problem was the train engineers felt like the train, that actual locomotive and everything, that was their personal property. And they pull into some town or village and they say, well, you know, I happen to know the coffee shop. The engineer would say that coffee shop down there's got really good coffee. So I'm going to go there and have a cup of coffee and we'll leave whenever I get ready. They pull into the next town or village. You say, well, you know, I want some cannelloni. I'm going to go get some cannelloni or whatever. Visit the wife and kids or whatever. And they go, come and go as the engineer pleased. Well, that's no way to run a railroad. And everybody felt like if he was going to try and get the railroads to run on time, you know, that was going to be an impossibility. But I have to say, it was possible. All you have to do is shoot one or two engineers, wait for them to have some kind of a train wreck or get something like really go bad, go wrong, and you just shoot the engineer. And once you have a few of them executed, which is what he did, then all the other engineers say, okay, well, this train is going to pull into the station on time and we're going to leave on time. And although it was brutal, it was also efficient. And he could justify shooting these engineers because he waited for a train wreck to happen. He waited for some sort of fatality or some sort of bad accident, and he just had the guy shot. And what would the Italian people say? Well, okay, yeah, that guy made a bad, bad mistake, and he got shot for it. We don't like that, but the trains are running on time, and we do like that. So it is an efficient government, but it is brutal. It is very, very brutal. Now, one of the driving motives of the fascist party, one of the things that Mussolini insisted upon is looking back to recreate ancient Rome. Please write that down. He's going to look back to recreate ancient Rome. And he wants to say, okay, the Mediterranean, that is going to be a, an Italian lake. That's the way it is. We're going to recreate ancient Rome. And so to do that, we're going to start expanding, which is one of the steps. So the first expansion that they did, they moved into Libya and they began to like build towns and cities. They put in another port and they started building a Tripoli and they started like expanding. And you see all sorts of Roman symbolism everywhere. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the, the, his hat on that top image, that, that eagle there, that is again, that's a, a, a reference to ancient Rome. Uh, down below, uh, that that's not a number one on his hat. If you'll scroll back to the slide that had the flags, you'll see that symbol in the center of the flag is the same symbol that he has on his uh, hat there in the bottom. And this is called a fasci. And a fasci is a Roman symbol. It's very, very Roman. It's a bundle of sticks with an axe tied up in the middle of it. And it's very, very Roman. It's a, a reference to the Roman democracy. And so you see these Roman symbols everywhere. And Mussolini is capitalizing on this idea of recreating ancient Rome. And the Italian people are like, they're absolutely, they're okay with that. So he crossed the Atlantic. He takes over Libya. Uh, he tries to go out and gather up, uh, snatch up Ethiopia, which would never had been, that had never even been Roman. But he sees an opportunity, tries to grab it. And he's like trying to grab different places throughout the, uh, uh, the, the Mediterranean basin. And so he's taking one step after another after another, and nobody's stopping him. 
So the fascist party starts to win elections, and they win every election all the way up to 1943. Now, one of the ways you're going to do this is by violence. Strong note here. Where the Japanese had used violence openly and against the opposition party. Mussolini will use violence secretly against the opposition party. Mussolini will use violence secretly against the opposition party. Now, the way this works, okay, there'd be some opposition party member in there, out there, that'd be saying bad things about the fascist, yelling his head off, making speeches. Okay, well, it turns out that he had a boating accident. Never mind the fact that the anchor chain was wrapped around this guy's ankles and his hands were tied behind his back. It was a boating accident. He slipped over the side with an anchor tied to him. Well, what could happen? You know, he's going to drown. Or there was a construction accident. Yeah, this um, this guy was making some speech or something, and, you know, a wall fell over on him. It was a construction accident. Sorry, he's dead. Forget about that the fact that his feet were, like, in concrete, and he couldn't make a dodge for it. This wall fell over him. And it was, you know, that's the way it happened. Or he died of a heart attack. Yeah, a 38 caliber heart attack. Somebody pumped a bullet or two right in his chest. A 38 caliber heart attack. What did he die of? Heart attack. Heart failure. Yeah, it didn't work. So that's the sort of stuff that would go on. He would just lie and lie and lie about it. But this had the effect of intimidating any other political party. So again, Mussolini's getting away with all this stuff, and he's encouraged. The Italian economy is doing okay. The people are really happy with what's going on. Um, and he's winning elections time after time after time after time. Now, he did make a fatal mistake. He decided that he was going to sign a contract with a new emerging power in Europe, and that's Germany. And this contract, this um, treaty, is called the Triparty Act, and it's Germany, Japan, and Italy, the Triparty Act. And this just simply says, listen, if anybody attacks you, then we'll come in and defend you. We've seen that sort of thing before with entangling alliances. In 1940, uh, Germany will attack uh, France, and at the last second, and for no other reason to have some tiny little territorial gain, Mussolini made a fatal mistake, and he joined Germany in the attack on France in 1940. And that meant that Italy had crossed the line. There's no, they'd taken one step after another, after another, after another, until the only outcome is war. And so Italy joined the Germans, which was a terrible mistake. And that's how they got dragged into World War II. So with that in mind now, in other words, we've done every step with the Italians. They go through every one of these steps that George Kennan had outlined. With that in mind, let's go talk about Germany. Now, a lot has been written about Germany. I'm going to try and keep it simple and direct. Finally, we're going to start talking about Germany and how they got into World War II. Now, again, in the overall, I want you guys to be thinking about um, how any of this affected America. We talked about the Japanese right up until the attack on Pearl Harbor. None of that affected America. And nobody wanted to get involved. With what's going on in Italy, none of that affected the United States of America. And nobody wanted to have anything to do with it. Nobody was taking the Italians seriously. Uh, they certainly weren't taking Mussolini seriously. So none of that had anything to do with the United States. Now, when we start talking about Germany, we have to remember our acronym BRAT. I told you we're going to need it. Now you do. And again, this is why uh, modern historians talk about how um, when we talk about the underlying cause of World War II, which is the rise of these dictators, um, they refer back to the Treaty of Versailles. Well, that had nothing to do with the Japanese. It didn't have anything to do really with the, with the Italians or only peripherally. Both of those countries have been our allies. Germany had been our adversary, but as you're about to see, all the major elements of BRAT are going to be dealt with long before the war starts. So we have to start with a B in BRAT, which, as you recall, because in your notes, is blame for the war. Germany has to accept blame for the war. Well, the Germans didn't like that one bit, and they felt there was plenty of blame to go around, which there was. So they have to find a scapegoat, and this is going to serve the Nazis well. But the origin of that, we have to go back a little bit farther, and that is anti-Semitism. And the roots of modern anti-Semitism in Germany 
go to one guy, and that's Richard Wagner. I'm, I'm sorry to say this, but Richard Wagner is it. And Richard Wagner was a very famous composer, a composer of classical music. You guys all know all the music that he did. Uh, think of Valkyrian writ. Um, I'm not bad at singing or anything, and I'm just going to like hum it sort of. But dun 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 that's him. That's Valkyrian writ, right of the Valkyries. So we're talking about the 1880s, 1890s, when he was at the height of his career. And he's writing operas that are really, really super popular in Germany. Everybody's listening to his music. And uh, even today, um, the Israel, Israel's Philharmonic Org Orchestra, they play Wagner all the time. And it's really, really controversial because Richard Wagner hated Jews. He hated them. I've read some of the pamphlets that this guy's written, and it's scurrilous. This guy's a monster. He hated the Jews. Well, how does that affect us here? Strong note, because this is the connection. Richard Wagner was this, like, absolute star in Germany. He was absolutely famous, and everybody loved this guy to pieces. And so, all of the elite, the rich, wealthy, the elite, they all wanted to be associated with Richard Wagner. They all wanted to, like, run around with this guy and be seen with him and shake hands with him and, and go to all of his operas and go to all of his plays and go to all of his... Uh, um, in, to the orchestra and listen to all his music all the time. Uh, the record player was like really a big deal back in those days. And he was pumping out record after record after record and it made him rich. So he's running around with the rich, wealthy elite, but he's very, very virulently, bitterly anti-Semitic. It's horrible, the stuff that he wrote. And this means that to the broader German population, that if the rich, wealthy elite are running around with this guy who's really bitterly anti-Semitic, then it's okay to be anti-Semitic. It's okay to hate Jews. That's the real connection. Well, World War I came along. Now, by this time, Richard Wagner is dead, uh, but a young Austrian guy named Adolf Hitler was really, like, absolutely fascinated with the music, as everybody else was in Germany and, in this case, Austria. But Hitler took one kind of step further. He sort of tried to associate himself with the Wagner family. He wrote a lot of letters uh, to the daughter, to the son-in-law. They were really anti-Semitic, but he kept writing letters to them all the time, like fan letters. And they started kind of paying attention to this Hitler guy and wrote him a few letters back. Well, World War I came along, and Hitler was involved in the war. Strong note. Now, he went through the war. Uh, he was Austrian, but he joined the German army. Uh, he was involved in the Western Front. Super strong note here. At the last few months of the war, 1918, summer 1918, going into the fall, Germany was actually advancing. They'd broken through the lines. Uh, the stalemate was kind of ending. Uh, the war in uh, Russia was already over with. Uh, they'd signed the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk and beat the Russians. The Russians were out of the war. And Germany looked like they were going to be victorious. But Hitler was wounded in a uh, poison gas attack. And he got it in his eyes and he breathed some of it in. So he was like sent back home to Germany as an invalid. He was wounded in action, but it's wounded uh, by, by the use of these uh, gas attacks. Anyway, he's laying there in the hospital. And the next thing he knows, well, Germany's lost. And he could not understand that. Germany had lost the war. But the last thing he knew, as a soldier on the front lines, is that they were advancing. They were winning. Victory was in sight. And then suddenly, a few weeks later, Germany's lost. It's in the newspapers. And they're having to give up. Well, from that, let's kind of think more broadly. The German people couldn't understand it, how they'd lost. German propaganda had been the, their, 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 were the victims, that the war was not their fault. Uh, the German people said, well, who are we going to, you know, how, how's this blame going to work out then? They couldn't blame the Kaiser because the Kaiser kept saying, listen, uh, we're the victims here. We're the ones that were under attack. We're the ones that were surrounded. And the Kaiser had kept up a strong propaganda and he was very, very, you know, he was the, the embodiment of the German people. 
so they couldn't blame him. Furthermore, he had abdicated, and he was in Holland, so it wasn't going to help to, like, you know, blame him anyway. He wasn't there. Nobody in Germany could blame the German army for failure. Uh, everybody had a friend or a relative, a son, a daughter, an uncle, an aunt, a cousin, somebody had been in the German army. And many of them had been killed. They'd sacrificed. So the German army had done really well, and nobody could blame the German army. They couldn't blame themselves. They couldn't bring themselves to blame the German generals. The German generals kept saying, listen, we did everything we could. The German people could not blame themselves. They felt like they were victims as well. They'd sacrificed so much. They'd put up with so much. They'd knuckled under and had done everything. And they, too, had felt that all these other countries were out to get them, the British, the French, and the Russians. So along came this idea that is called the Dolchstossen. You don't have to worry about that. It's a German word, the Dolchstossen. The stab in the back. Do write that down. What emerged among the German people was this stab in the back theory that it was Jews who did it, that the Jews are to blame. I'll have that on the next slide as well. And so German propagandists began to like really, you know, kind of push this idea that the Jews had done it, that the Jews had all the money. Then, as you all know, the economy tanked. Hyperinflation and, and terrible things were happening. And the people in Germany kept thinking, well, somebody's got to be blamed. Somebody's going to be held responsible for that. And so you're going to blame those Jews. Now, back to Hitler. Now, Hitler got out of the hospital. The war is over with. He doesn't have a job. He doesn't have anything to do. Uh, and he's, like, really deeply depressed. Evidently, he considered suicide for a while there, as so many Germans did. And uh, for reasons we don't have time to get into, he was approached by the Munich Police Department. And the Munich Police Department said, listen, we think that you should like work for us and we want you to be an informant and we'll give you a little bit of money and you can kind of help us out. And here was Adolf Hitler and he's like had no job. He had nothing else going on. He said, sure, I'll be glad to help you guys. Yeah, I'm looking to like, you know, you're trying to be a, a positive member of society. And so strong note here, the Munich Police Department told him to go join one of these underground political groups. And the underground political group is called the NSDAP. Now, this is in German. Don't freak out. The NSDAP stands for National Socialistische Deutsche Arbeiterpartei. That translates into, this you do need to worry about, is the National Socialist German Workers' Party. The NSDAP is the German, is the National Socialist German Workers Party. Now, in our part, in our pattern, that's the rise of a nationalist militarist party. Well, what does the National Socialist German Workers Party stand for? Well, nationalist, they stand for Germany. Socialism, they agree with that. Socialism was big in Germany, still is today. Everybody agreed with that. German, well, national German, yeah, same thing. They agree with that. Workers, well, who agrees with the workers? Everybody wants to agree with the workers. Wow, let's let's go for the workers. Party. So this is the National Socialist German Workers' Party, and there was, you know, a Nationalist Militarist Party. Well, so he goes and joins his party. Strong note. This was unexpected. Hitler gets into this party, and he discovers that they are all saying exactly what he agreed with. He was like, wow, all the things you guys are talking about are amazing to me. I agree with every bit of this. And he listened for a while and he went to the, some of their meetings. And as chance would have it, uh, he got up and started speaking one day. And he says, listen, I have some things I want to say. And he made a couple of like small time speeches. And everybody else said, hey, you're really great at this, you know, speech making and stuff. And so we're going to kind of put you in charge. You're going to move up in the party. So as time went on, uh, he became a party leader. So take a look at that picture down in the lower left. And you can see Adolf Hitler there in the front um, to the kind of the left side of the photograph. That guy in the black tie there uh, signing right kind of right beside Hitler. Uh, that is a guy named Rudolf, Hef, Rudolf Hess, and he was the assistant party leader to the NSDAP. Immediately behind Hitler in that black hat there 
That is uh, Heinrich Himmler. And Heinrich Himmler, he had not even been uh, able to be in the German army during World War I uh, because his eyesight was really bad. He was a chicken farmer. But he got um, involved early on in the party, and he was kind of the enforcement guy. Uh, the guy right behind Hitler on uh, what would it be Hitler's uh, left side, I think that's the Gauleiter of Berlin. I'm not too sure, but I think that's the Gauleiter of Berlin. In other words, the party leader of Berlin, the, the district guy. And so here they are. Take a look at their uniforms. They're all in these uniforms. And so they're a nationalist militarist party. And so Hitler gets involved in this thing. Strong note. And there's always going to be this strong anti-Semitic element to it. Hitler gets that from his involvement with the Wagner family. Again, not from Wagner directly. Uh, he never knew Wagner. Wagner was dead when Adolf Hitler was a kid. But Adolf Hitler never left. He never stopped this relationship with the Wagner family. And they're very, very deeply anti-Semitic. He also plays upon this idea of the stab in the back, that the Jewish people had withheld all the money, had wrecked up the economy, they had all the money. Uh, I'm sorry to tell you this, but it's perfectly true. Uh, if you talk to uh, people in Germany today, as I have, uh, sometimes they'll say, yeah, that's actually, that's true. In other words, this idea that the Jews did it, that they somehow earned what happened, that's, that's an idea that's still in Germany. I can't believe it. When I hear it, I'm like, what? You can't say things like that. It's horrible. Strong note. 1923, 1924, the National Socialist German Worker Party, the Nazi Party, National Socialistische, that's a contraction, a German contraction of the phrase Nazi. They tried a violent overthrow. Strong note, they tried a violent overthrow. And that failed. Now Hitler was thrown in prison. And while he was in prison, he wrote a book called Mein Kampf, which means my fight or my struggle. Again, the Wagner connection there is that the Wagner family supplied him with the typewriter and all the paper. Uh, sidebar, for those of you guys who ever have to read any part of Mein Kampf, please understand this. And, you know, you have to write a strong note, but do keep, keep this in the back of your mind. Mein Kampf is not, is not, is not a blueprint for World War II. It is not. Mein Kampf is this long string of, like, stream of consciousness thinking, and it's just hate, and it's just this message Adolf Hitler is dictating this thing, and Rudolf Hess, who happened to be in the prison with him, is the one that actually typed it all up. <coughs> and the whole thing needs a lot of editing. It needs to be edited into the dustbin. But Mein Kampf will be like, okay, maybe we need to like do something in Russia and get some land out there, but I hate the Jews. Oh, the Jews, they're like really, really evil. And then it'll say, okay, you know, we need to build up our industry and do this and the other, but the Jews, wow, the Jews, yeah, we're going to get rid of those Jews. They'll say, maybe the Air Force, maybe we can do something with the Air Force, but the Jews, man, we got to get rid of those guys. And it's just horrible. But while he was in prison, and this is the strong that I do want you to take, he came to the conclusion that a violent overthrow was not going to work. He had to use the democratic process. Please write that down. While Hitler was in prison, in Landsberg Prison, for this attempted violent overthrow, he came to the conclusion that a violent overthrow would not work. You have to use the political process. So Hitler gets out of prison. It's 1926. He cleans out the party. He puts a better image on them. Uh, and he begins to like, make, uh, make broader inroads politically. Uh, he becomes really adept at doing speeches. And he travels the country saying that, you know, Germans got to pull themselves together. Uh, we've got to work things out. Now, again, strong note here. In the meantime, America's come along with the DOS plan, the Young plan, and we fixed their economy. And their economy was coming back. And so Germans were feeling a little bit better about themselves. And things were like still terrible in Germany, but it was, you know, things were coming along. And then Hitler comes along and says, oh, by the way, you know, we lost the war because of the Jews. Well, everybody liked that message. You know, he reconciled that with the German people. So that got rid of Brat. That got, got rid of the B and Brat. So then along came the Great Depression. Now, that was in 1929, and the Americans said, listen, we're not going to make the Germans pay us back. We're not going to make them, uh, we're going to suspend payments for a while until we get through this economic downturn. 
But Hitler kept saying, listen, we're not going to pay that back. We're not going to pay that back. And we're not going to pay that back. So in 1933, strong note now, in 1933, Hitler, who had cleaned up the party and got things on track and was saying all the things that the German people were agreeing with, he got elected. Strong, strong note here. Hitler and the Nazis got elected with 43% of the vote, 43%, 43%, and that is the highest percentage of the vote that they will ever achieve. They never got more than 43% of the vote. They had to like face elections again in the, throughout the 1930s and then in the 1940s, but the party never got above 43%. The problem was that the other 57% were split among many different parties. Please write that down. The other part of the German electorate, 57%, voted for other parties. There was the Communist Party. It was tiny. Then there's the CDU and the SPD. Those are two parties that are still in Germany today. Uh, the CDU is the Christian Democratic Union, and they're on the middle right. Uh, the Social Democrats of the middle left. Those are the two biggest parties in Germany. And there was a half a dozen smaller parties. And so the rest of the vote was divided up into smaller parties. So the Nazi party, with 43% of the vote, they had the biggest minority. And that meant that Hitler was going to be the prime minister. They called him the chancellor of Germany. And so immediately, in 1933, he became the chancellor of Germany. And he said, okay, I'm going to get rid of all these other offices. Uh, Paul Hindenburg, who was in his 90s by that time, he died. And Hitler said, I'm going to take his office over and make it my own, the president of Germany. And then the, the minister of defense, that was held by somebody else. And Hitler said, I'm going to take over as the minister of defense. And he kept taking over office after office and bringing it to himself. And that's how he overthrew from within. Furthermore, before the election, he told all the industrialists, you know what, I'm going to get rid of all of uh, the labor unions. So I'm going to try and like suppress the labor unions. And so the industrialists said, well, you have our support. And he told all the labor unions, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to make these industrialists do the right thing by you guys. And so all the labor unions said, wow, hooray for Hitler. Well, then when he did get elected, he did say the labor unions, you guys are all wiped out. You're destroyed. But then he told the rich, wealthy elite, all the big business owners, now you're basically working for the state of Germany. And if you don't teach your, teach your German, the German worker right, we're coming after you. It's going to be bad, particularly if you're Jewish. So he destroyed both sides, his constituents, but then he helped, he helped them at the same time. So he's very duplicity, he's very manipulative. But what happens next is he repudiates the debt. He, re he says, listen, I'm not going to pay off the war debt. We're not going to pay that anymore. And that got rid of the R in Brat. Reparations, he's going to get rid of that. Strong note, no one expected Germany to pay that. It was a global economic meltdown because of the depression in the United States. So the French and the, Germ the, French and the British were saying, listen, we've actually got the debt under control. We're doing okay. When you guys can pay it off, pay it off. But we're not going to hold you to that right now. So observe, ladies and gentlemen, what has happened. Hitler got elected, and he took a step. He got rid of the labor unions, and then he told industry, you better do what you're told. And he got away with that. Then he got rid of reparations, and he got away with that. Then he put all the blame of the war, he put that on the Jews, and he got away with that. And he's going to continue to like get away with these things. Strong note here. It's not on the slide. You have to write this down. The next thing he's going to do is have Anschluss with Austria. A-N-S-C-H-L-U-S-S. -S -S, Anschluss. Now, this was strictly forbidden in the Treaty of Versailles. Can't have Anschluss. Anschluss means to lock together. And this means to have unify, unification with Austria. And that was strictly forbidden in the Treaty of Versailles. He's going to do that. There's going to be a lot of Nazis in uh, Austria. And he goes down there and says, hey, do you Nazis want to be part of the greater Germany? And everybody says, yes. So he has Anschluss. Then he begins to build and build and build and build and build which is going to lead to another couple of slides. 
But right now I want to talk about a little bit of propaganda. And that leads us to this guy called Julius Streicher. And that's his picture down there. Um, his propaganda photograph, that's him, that bald guy. Now, Julius Streicher is the propaganda minister before Goebbels gets in. He'll continue to run newspapers, Julius Streicher will, and then Goebbels, uh, Joseph Goebbels, he'll be actually in charge of that in a propaganda ministry. Well, Julius Streicher, was a, he was a terrible, terrible human being, and he hated Jews like really, really badly, as the next slide will show. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the next slide is, I'm telling you right now, it's, really, it's one of the bad ones. Not because you're going to see a whole lot of dead bodies, but because of the message that's being involved there. So let's go to the next slide and see what Julius Streicher was telling the German people and how propaganda actually worked in Germany in the 1930s. So this is Julius Streicher's newspaper. It's called the Sturmer. The Sturmer. And it says, and I know you guys don't read German very well, the Deutsche Wolkenblatt zum Kampf an der Wahrheit. The German newspaper involved in the fight for the truth. And then in red there, it says the Mobile Machen der Volks. The mobilization the votes means the mobilization of the people, getting the people out there to fight these battles. And in black there, kind of on the left side, it says the Kampf der Weltfeind, the, the, the fight against the enemy of the planet. The picture is der Satan, and that is one of these, um, these stereotypical views of a Jew. This, this terrible, terrible picture of a Jew that's, that's just so stereotypical. And they put that in there, okay, and they're saying this is Satan. This is the evil one. Then at the very bottom, it said, the Juden sind unser Unglück. And that means the Jews are our misfortune. And it's just this hate upon hate upon hate. This particular newspaper was in 1943, but all through the 1930s and 40s, um, Julius Streicher will be out there. And this resonated with a lot of German people. And what it means is you can like do anything you want to to a Jew, and they did a lot, and, and basically get away with it. And it's horrible. What's important here is, and um, a lot of historians make a lot of, uh, out of this. Uh, Anthony B. War makes a lot out of it. Uh, Gerhard Weinberg makes a lot out of it. Uh, a lot of these guys are, are talk about this, and they say, okay, you got to understand what's really going on here. By making it okay to like do things to Jewish people, you're creating a group of people who get up in the morning, they have an interaction with their family, and they go to work. And at their job, day in and day out, they're doing bad things to other human beings. Putting them in the concentration camps, maltreating them, murdering them, killing them. And then when they get off work at night, they go home, they have an interaction with their wife and kids, drink a quiet beer, have a nice meal, put the kids off to bed. You know, the next day, get up and do it again. On Sunday, you're going to go to church. And so you have a hardcore group of people who day in and day out are, that's what they do in life. They're murderers. And Julius Streicher is part of this machine that makes that okay. Another piece of propaganda up in the upper, um, what would it be, the upper right? Vaufur, for what reason? And here again, you have that stereotypical uh, Jewish face in the background, big giant question mark. And in the foreground, you see all those soldiers dead from World War I. And the question is, for what reason? And it's the Jew who had done that. So again, that absolves the German people of blame for the war. And they feel pretty good about that. Then the economy is beginning to pick up. More about that in a moment. But it's Hitler and the Nazi party that are claiming all of the credit for all that. And that's what propaganda is really all about. Um, one of the other party leaders is none other than Hermann Goering. He'd been a World War I ace. He'd done really good in World War I. But he, he famously said, if you yell a lie loud enough and long enough, people will begin to believe it. And, um, wow, the Nazis, they, they were masters at that sort of thing. But let's continue on. Now, we're still in the 1930s. And so we need to do um, blame for the war. We're going to blame the Jews for that. That's what the Germans are going to do. Then uh, reparations, were gonna, Hitler said in 1933, as soon as he got into power in 33, we're not going to pay all those reparations. Again, nobody's saying that he had to, but he's taking one step at a time. Another thing that he has to do is deliver the perceived will of the people. That's on our list of things to do. So he's going to begin building autobahns. Now, the case can be made, and it's true, that the autobahn building that he did actually before the war was not very extensive. 
or only a couple of hundred miles of that. I'm not interested in the Autobahn itself. I'm interested in what it does. In other words, it puts people back to work. These are public works projects that puts a lot of people back to work. Think of the engineering, laying it all out, doing the roadbed, doing the overpasses, doing everything necessary to make this great big gigantic super highway that's going to travel all over Germany. And this put a huge number of people back to work. And it also increased commerce because you have cars and trucks that can use the Autobahn to get from place to place to place more efficiently, more quickly. And this is something the Germans were very proud of. That's a propaganda photograph in that lead car there. You can see there's Adolf Hitler. And all these Nazi flags are all over the place. Some guy on the bridge back there doing that Nazi Sea Heil salute. And so this put a lot of people back to work. And, and Hitler is delivering. They began to rebuild the Navy, which again was strictly forbidden in the Treaty of Versailles. But they began building battleships. Uh, you can see the, the Hipper is one of them, and the Graf Spee is the other one. The Graf Spee is the one on the over left, and the, the Hipper is the one on the upper right. And they began building battleships. I don't care about the battleships, not even a little bit. Think how much engineering went into them, how much technology went into them, all the steel that went into them, how many people got put back to work. And the Germans were really proud of these ships. Now, the British, and the, the British were a little bit nervous about this, and, but then they said, yeah, but we've got this gigantic navy of our own. And the Germans are not going to challenge us to sea, which is true. Furthermore, uh, there was the emerging realization that the aircraft carrier was actually the wave of the future. And the British were starting to uh, develop that. And the Americans were developing it in a big way. But to the Germans, <clears throat> that was completely lost on them. It's immaterial. The Germans, the, the Nazi party was delivering. They also began to like build an air force. Now, they were doing that in secret because they had a national airline called Lufthansa. Lufthansa is still out there. But they were taking all these pilots and training them through Lufthansa to be pilots. And that made them good, you know, bomber pilots and tra air transport pilots and, in fact, fighter pilots. And so Lufthansa was doing that. And it was a big front. But it was also a growing German air technology, and it was helping them. Another thing, very famously, is uh, the development of the automobile industry. And you see Hitler there. He's leaning over, and he's like got a big smile on. And he's taking a look at an iconic uh, German production called the Volkswagen, the Volkswagen Beetle, the Kiefer. That's what it's called, I guess, Kiefer. And so <clears throat> the phrase Volkswagen says it all, the people's car. And it was their version of the Model T. It's very simple design, very aerodynamic. It looked like a modern car that nobody had ever seen before. The fuel, uh, the, I'm sorry, the engine is really, really simple. It's an air-cooled engine. It actually gets quite a bit of horsepower, 35, 40 horses. And it's really, really super efficient. And it was designed by a guy named Ferdinand Porsche. Uh, if you can see the hand pointing at the VW Beetle, that arm belongs to none other than Ferdinand Porsche, as in Porsche. He developed that, and part of the Porsche industries, a split off from that was Volkswagen, VW today. And so here was Hitler putting people back to work in the automobile industry, putting the work on the Autobahns, building a new Air Force and a new Air Corps. He's like, listen, I'm going to like start building the Army again. We're going to have Anschluss with Austria, which is what everybody wanted. So he's taking one step after another, after another, after another. He's delivering the, the perceived will of the people. Um, he's overthrown from within violence. Let's talk about violence for a moment. Now, the Germans are going to exhibit violence differently than the Japanese, and they're going to do, execute, uh, they're going to have violence different from the Italians. Hitler said this, and please write down a strong note here. You may not exhibit any violence to the other political parties. Can't do that, except to the communists. But that was a tiny little party, and most people hated him anyway. But you can't exhibit violence toward the other parties. So the Nazis will exhibit violence openly, but against part of their own party. The Nazis are going to exhibit violence openly and against an element, a part of their own party. So here's how that works. Within the NSDAP, within the National Socialist German Workers' Party, there were two major factions. 
One is called the SS, the Schutzstaffel, which basically translates into the Guard Echelon. And the other one's called the SA, which is called the Sturm Abteilung. And that means like the storming party. And they have these very militaristic names. Well, the leader of the SA was a guy named Ernst Rome, E-R-N-S-T. R-O-H-M. And over the O, you got to put those two little dots, that umlaut, you got to put that under there. R-O-H-M, Ernst Röhm. Well, so there became a, a power struggle between the SS and the SA. And Hitler started back in the SS. He didn't like Ernst Röhm. We don't have time to get into that. So he used um, part of uh, Ernst Röhm's personality against him. Um, I'm not trying to be... Um, I don't know, negative about this, but it turns out that uh, Ernst Röhm was gay. <clears throat> Ernst Röhm was gay. And so Hitler waited until Ernst Röhm was having a big gay party with a bunch of these guys from the SA, and he busted in on the party with part of the SS and had a big giant execution called the Night of the Long Knives. And so uh, Ernst Röhm, the, 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 the rumor is, the story is, that Hitler actually shot Ernst Röhm himself. So they got away with that because Hitler came out and the SS came out and he had all these propaganda guys come out and say, listen, here's this faction that was in the NSDAP and they all turned out to be homosexual. They turned out to be gay and we had to get rid of the subversive element. And the German people were like, yeah, well, good idea. You know, that, was, that, that turned out to be a, a good thing. Um, that's, that's just the, the morals of those days. And so Hitler's going to use violence openly, but against parts of his own party. He absolutely forbade anybody from the NSDAP, from the, the Nazi party, to exhibit violence towards another political party, especially the CDU or the SPD. <laughs> so Hitler's taking one step after another, after another, after another, and he's getting away with it and getting away with it and getting away with it. He rebuilds the army, rebuilds the navy, uh, rebuilds the air force. Uh, he stops paying the reparations. He has Anschluss with Austria, and he's doing whatever he wants. So finally, he said, listen, I'm going to take over part of Czechoslovakia. And that was in 1939. I'm sorry, 1938. He said, I'm going to take over part of Czechoslovakia. There are ethnic Germans living there. It's called the Sudetenland. The Sudetenland, S-U-D-E-N-T-E-N-L-A-N-D, one word. S-U-D-E-N-T. E-N-L-A-N-D, Sudetenland. So he took over the Sudetenland that was filled with ethnic Germans. And this is a land grab. Well, the Sudetenland today is now part of the Czech Republic. And then he made it pretty clear he's going to take over the rest of Czechoslovakia. Now here the British did get involved. And the leader of Great Britain at the time was a guy named Neville Chamberlain. And Neville Chamberlain flew to Munich and he said, listen here, Hitler, we're going to have a discussion about this. And, you know, this far and no farther. You can't do what you're doing. And Hitler said, well, now listen, let's just have, let us have our own way in Czechoslovakia and then we'll stop. Which was a lie. Hitler knew it was a lie when he, when he said it. But Chamberlain agreed. Now, a lot of people blame Chamberlain over this, and they say this is appeasement, which as it turns out it was. But please understand Chamberlain's position. Chamberlain had been an eyewitness to World War I. Britain had really gotten nothing out of World War I. They'd lost millions of men killed. Others were wounded and mangled up. They're still covering Great Britain. Their economy had been wrecked up. And... Basically, they'd achieved basically nothing. They defeated Germany, but it was a Germany that was just hollowed out by the war. And the people of Britain absolutely were clear that they did not want another conflict. They did not want another conflict. Chamberlain had seen the conflict, the First World War. And he's like, we're not going to do that again. We're never going to do that again. Never, never. And so here's Hitler, this guy that's all about himself, and he's really, really aggressive. So Chamberlain's like saying, listen, you can't continue to do what you're doing. And he extracted this promise out of Hitler that was a lot of wishful thinking. You know, 10%, you know, we've got a deal, and 90% wishful thinking. 
hoping that the deal would stick. But Hitler had his own agenda. And so he just lied to Chamberlain. Chamberlain went back to Great Britain and said, listen, I got a deal. Hitler said, this far and no farther. There were a lot of skeptics in Great Britain, but Chamberlain did what the British people wanted. Stopped Hitler, at least temporarily, everybody was hoping. Again, World War II had not happened yet. Anyway, Hitler saw his opportunity and he said, okay, my next target is actually Poland. And he felt like he could get away with it. Attack Poland, make a deal with the Russians. Russia would get part of Poland and he would get the other part of Poland. And so the Russians and the Germans kind of made that deal. He teamed up with the, with the Italians. He felt stronger there. He teamed up with the Japanese, made a deal with them, the Tripart Act. And he felt really, really strong. He felt very secure. He knew the British weren't going to do anything, and the French were a complete wreck internally, politically. So, in uh, September 1939, he attacked Poland. Well, strong note here, I'm almost done. The Poles had seen this coming. They were deathly afraid of Germany. Germany and Poland, they border one another, and the Poles were like, oh my God, the Germans are coming to get us, which was true. The Poles had a kind of a spy organization, but certainly they could read the German newspaper. They knew what was about to happen. Hitler was being pretty open about it. So Poland had reached out to Great Britain and said, listen, if Germany invades us, will you help? And Chamberlain said, yes, we will help you. They made a treaty. Chamberlain's point of view was maybe that will like curb the Germans. Maybe something, you know, they'll stop them. Well, of course, nothing will stop Hitler. So in 1939, September 1939, um, Germany attacked Poland. And again, although Chamberlain in Britain gets blamed for appeasement, in effect kind of blaming him for the outset of World War II, that's unfortunate because it is also Chamberlain who declared war on Germany. I, can't over, I cannot overstate that. Chamberlain declared war on Germany. Germany had taken one step after another, after another, after another. Finally, they attacked Poland, violated the treaty. Chamberlain said, listen, we've told the Germans, get out of Poland immediately, or a war is going to start. And the Germans did not get out of Poland. They did not, you know, stop doing what they're doing. So consequently, Great Britain is at war with Germany. It is Chamberlain who declared war on Germany. And while he may get the blame for appeasement, he gets no credit for trying to stop the Germans, and he should get that credit. So America gets into war uh, a year later, 1942, two years later, in 1941, because of the Japanese. And immediately we're going to attack, and we're going to, um, Hitler's going to declare war in the United States, which is how we got into war in Europe. But that's a story for a different time. So with that in mind, uh, let's go to the next slide. I'm done talking about the rise of the dictators. And let's take a look at what's next. What's next in uh, History 1302 is World War II. Now, for those of you who are looking to uh, this class, like explain World War II, we don't have time for that. Uh, in graduate school, I must have taken a half a dozen courses, seminar courses, about World War II, and we, as historians, are just now scratching the surface. That's just how complex this war was. But I will give you a brief overview of the war and our theories of Allied victories. Then I'm going to talk primarily about the war on the home front, how we're going to mobilize everybody, how Hollywood's going to react as a, as a metaphor for how the American people see the war. I'll talk about the arsenal of democracy, outman, outgun, outproduce uh, our enemies. And then uh, we'll talk about a piece of technology, which again is the theory of allied victory, and uh, that is the bomb. And so uh, the bomb, that will be the, 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 the use of the atomic bomb, that will be a standalone presentation which should send a signal to you guys. So um, look for World War II and then another presentation, a separate presentation called The Use of the Atomic Bomb. Thank you for your attention. I think I went almost exactly two hours, which is a little bit long for one of my presentations, but that's, uh, that's kind of the way it went. Thank you all and uh, continue on watching uh, the presentations. Our second test will be coming up soon.